It's day 50 of the war in Ukraine, a war that has changed every aspect of life around us and will continue to do so in the near future as well. From politics to military and technology to the economy, the impact is, is, impact is being seen in every aspect of life. We'll be talking about all this and more on Mapping Fault Lines. We have with us Prabir Purkaista. Prabir, so uh, this is the 50th, 50th day of the war, like I said, and a lot of the implications are still yet to be seen. I mean, we're still in the very early stages, so to speak, of this war. But let's first take a look maybe at the military situation because that is the one that's kind of changing at an, uh, on almost a day-to-day -day basis, multiple reports coming in. Broadly, we have so many variations of what is happening on the ground in terms of reports, some from the West, some from Russian sources, of course. So for the clarity of your viewers, how would you sort of analyze and place the military situation on the ground as is now? Well, as you were saying, there is a deep fog of war that is there. So each side is claiming different things. And of course, there are talks of atrocities. Now, as we know, talks of atrocities are also extremely political and extremely propagandized. We have taken earlier the case of Syria, for example, we have discussed in NewsClick as well that the so-called false flag attacks on Duma, uh, claiming Assad was using uh, poison gas, all of this we have seen, they had clear political agenda, as perhaps some of the uh, attacks that are being talked about, for instance, Bucha and so on. So I'm not going to get into that. But if you look at the larger political picture that you now, for instance, you can see in the map itself, it is clear that there are two interpretations of the war. One is that Putin apparently expected a lightning victory in uh, Ukraine, fall of Kiev, taking over all of you, Ukraine and so on, which I don't think was ever a realistic picture of what any, any military could do. After all, you know, even if you take the Second World War, Panzer divisions, this is not the rate at which uh, even the Nazi uh, military forces really uh, uh, went and captured various places. So that seems to be a, a figment of the Western military imagination to claim that Ukraine has done much better than what it indeed might have. If we take the Russian side, they had said demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Now, denazification is a political process. It needs the Ukrainian side to agree in order for that to happen. So that's really a question of the political settlement that's finally reached. For the demilitarization, it needs the military forces of Ukraine to be interdicted and also made immobilized and destroyed. This is the, the way it would really unfold. And that, if you look at the picture now, you can see in the east that this is where the most of the uh, war-ready forces were deployed because Donetsk, Lugansk regions were the places where they were not willing to concede autonomy. Right. They're not willing to accept the implementation of the Minsk Accords and from Russian sources that they were poised for an attack on these regions. And the Russian recognition was essentially to forestall that. And now their deployment seems to be to create conditions by which these forces are slowly destroyed. If you look at the larger picture, which is of course taking over Mariupol, uh, protecting Sevastopol, providing water for the Crimean Peninsula, all of it is to be also looked at in a different way, that they have essentially made Ukraine Air Force really uh, virtually useless at this point. They have degraded their anti-air uh, capabilities and they are slowly destroying the military. Ukrainian forces, particularly the most uh, advanced sections of the military. And this is what's happening in the Donbas region. Right. Now, if we take the picture of what the Russian forces were interested in as really destroying Ukrainians' military, what they call the demilitarization, that seems to have happened. And even if the NATO forces want to give them weapons, etc., it's not going to be easy to be able to make them battle ready and make the Ukrainian forces battle ready using these kind of weapons. Mm. Therefore, the need to source weapons which are much older, right. which Ukrainian forces may be already familiar with. So if we take this part of it, it seems that Russians were more interested 
in finishing the Ukrainian military forces rather than attacking the civilian centers. Mm -hmm. And if you take the fact that they have not taken out electricity in Ukraine, they have not taken out, for instance, the internet right. in Ukraine, it would seem to indicate their battle aims were very different from what the Western experts claim they are. So this is, I think, broadly what we can see. How far they are successful in the attempts to they destroy Ukraine's military, that we'll have to see. And how, what was their timetable? Putin never gave a timetable, right. unlike the Western experts who are giving timetables. But it is also true that uh, Mariupol was a, is a city they are going to take, because as of battalion was there, they are the ones who had driven out the Donbass forces from that part in 2014. So this was definitely a target, and this they are going to uh, not, uh, you know, back off from. So right. that is also clear what is happening. And Mariupol is also strategically important over there. So that, that part is going to happen. It looks like they have almost uh, taken over more also the port of Mariupol and only that very large steel plant. That is under siege at the moment. They have underground apparently right. facilities over there as well. So how that will take place, we have to see. But it's really a battle of attrition at the moment. And as you know, any built up areas, if they're to be taken, they require first at least a three is to one or five is to one superiority, which Russians have not deployed. But also then you have to you know, wait them out, wait the forces out till they run out of rations, they run out of uh, supplies and, and of course ammunition. So this is that battle of attrition is what's taking place in Mariupol over the last 25, 30 days. And that seems to be now near conclusion, though the steel plant in uh, Mariupol, which is, as I said, one of the largest steel plants in the world, that may still take some time before it's completely subdued. So looking at it from my point of view, the real issue is that the peace talks, which led at one point to withdrawal from the areas near Kiev, that does not seem to have proceeded any further. So is it something that uh, Russians think was bad faith, they made some concessions, nothing happened? Or is it something that uh, Zelensky and Russians didn't, could not agree on further, that's right. why nothing has to move forward? That's something we have to see. But, but it is also true, the kind of acquisitions of atrocities etc. that have been thrown do seem to indicate that the peace talks at the moment are going to be stimulated. We'll come back to the peace process, Prabir, but before that, I also wanted to take a look at the economic situation. We have had a lot of discussion on this, even on this show. Uh, some of the key aspects being the seizure, uh, the expropriation of uh, Russian assets, the rubles price initially, you know, uh, plummeting, but then reaching some kind of stability, concerns over oil, concerns over natural resources of various sorts. So in the medium to long term, how do you see the impact of this war across the world, actually? Because that's a key question a lot of people are having. I think there are three major issues that came out of the sanctions, as the West called it. Uh, SWIFT is a, something which is you can call a sanctions. But seizing foreign exchange reserves that Russia had earned and which was sparked in the West, this is something which did not have even the Crimean War when Russia and uh, in England were fighting. So this is something in terms of war, this is something new. Seizing a country of the size, small countries you can bully, but country of Russia's size, seizing their foreign exchange reserves is going one step beyond mm -hmm. what can be even called sanctions. Sanctions themselves are economic war, and they, in terms of international law, would be considered as acts of war. But seizing foreign exchange reserves, of which means that these are goods that you have bought, Though you have, you have paid for it, you have kept it in your bank. Now you're seizing that money, which means you have expropriated the goods that you actually bought. And you, whatever the money that you had to pay, you're not paying now. Right. So there are various ways of describing it, but it, is a, uh, it could be a strong inflection point in the world's money, his monetary history. Are then international currencies like euro and dollars or pounds, because all three have done this, 
Are they in fact dependable in terms of use in trade? And that's a country a question that countries like India, countries like China face. China has about a trillion dollars of uh, reserves in, parked in the, in the U.S. Treasury. India has about $640 billion uh, worth of foreign exchange, either in the dollars, in, held in dollars or held in uh, euros abroad. So these are again uh, then open to expropriation and all countries have to think of how do then we do uh, our trade because we keep foreign exchange reserves for a rainy day. Right. That in case our, uh, we need some immediate short term replenishment because we want to buy some things, yes, then we have the money to do so in foreign banks. So this is going to be a huge issue in terms of how does the dollar, which is de facto the global reserve currency, if not even de jure, that how does it then uh, survive in the future, the huge hit that its confidence would have taken by the virtue of this appropriation. So this is one issue. The second is there are certain commodities which are always going to be important. Every country needs it. One is of course energy, oil, and as well as coal, uh, liquid uh, LNG, I'm considering as equivalent to oil. Right. So oil, gas, and coal, these are things that still today are the backbone of your energy. And every country is dependent on a variety of mm -hmm. this in terms of proportions for meeting their energy needs. Yes, we have some amount of nuclear energy, not very large at the moment. And of course, you have the uh, renewables, but they do not, even today, are the major producers of energy. The kilowatts, megawatts, you can say they're very large. Right. But in terms of actual energy production, it still is largely coal. It's still your coal, oil, and uh, uh, natural gas, gas, natural gas, which is the uh, major source of energy. So the world is going to take a hit because the prices of oil will go up. Right now, we have a bit of an uh, advantage because Shanghai has been shut down. Therefore, there is a drop in a whole bunch of activities. Therefore, the energy prices have still not gone up. Plus the fact that Russians have said you can buy from us at a cheaper price. So they, that part of it is also depressing or right. keeping the prices lower than what it was projected to be. But don't forget, it's still 50% higher than what it was a year back. So it's already pretty high. So that is the second part of it, the energy economy. Because without energy, every country's industry is going to take a hit including India's, for example. We also need coal for it, right. not only just oil and uh, natural gas. The third is that the whole bunch of other uh, activities, for instance, you need fertilizers, you need, for instance, met metals. So all of this is also going to take a hit. So what you are likely to see is higher prices of all of these commodities, therefore inflation, but you are also going to see stagnation because we are not going to be able to meet to supply all of this. Yeah. So your energy, your industries are going to not see a boom in terms of being able to manufacture more, which is what you might expect if the prices go up. So you're going to get stagnation and inflation, inflation simultaneously. And particularly, there are inelastic demands, like food, for example. You take Sri Lankan example. The energy and food are not available. So what do the people do? So this might be replic replicated at a large scale across countries. And the big hit would be European Union. They don't have energy. They have decided to be very aggressive on Russia. How they will substitute for energy, which will shut down their industries, right. is a moot question. And Prabir, finally, so we've seen the economics, uh, the military situation, including the refugee crisis, of course. You've described how the economy, economic impact is actually global, not just restricted to Russia or Ukraine or even Europe. But in this context, we actually see that there's not really too much of a push for peace. Now, Russia and Ukraine have been negotiating at various points of time. You've described some of the issues that have complicated these negotiations. But globally, there doesn't seem to be much of a uh, you know, desire for, or a, uh, you know, at the diplomatic level, at the level of, say, various regional forums. There doesn't seem to be much of an initiative to push both these countries or push the West towards a move for peace. Why do you think that's the case? Well, I think one is that the uh, in the fog of war that we are talking about, there's been a huge campaign against Russia and this Western media 
which today dominates the information space, mm -hmm. is able to create an apparent op global opinion, which is Russia bad, Ukraine the victim, there are no Nazis, even though they say they are Nazis. <laughs> so all of this is one part of it. So you, and the, the global echo chamber that the West has built up, they start believing what they are pro propagating. Correct. If you see, for instance, which countries have sanctioned, you will find the 41 countries which have sanctioned Russia out of the 29 are European members of European Union. Mm -hmm. And if you put all the numbers together, well, they're one large country at most. You know. So that is the level at which this whole so-called global rule-based order seems to move, that we make the rules, what we say are, is the reality. Right. And I create the reality because I say so. So this seems to be the kind of mood that is set in the West. And they therefore start believing that everybody has isolated Russia, while the reality is the number of countries who have not sanctioned Russia is much larger than the number of countries who have. And if you take population into account, it's of course much, much larger, right. because India and China really have the world's population. So given that, I think the, my uh, apprehension or my concern is if the globe is facing this kind of future crisis, both stagnation, uh, inflation combined, you're going to see really huge hit to the uh, global food economy, mm -hmm. which might mean a whole bunch of countries will face the condition that Sri Lanka is in now, for example. Countries like India, fertilizers uh, crisis, coal uh, not being available for your power plants, all of this and global warming is going to take a huge hit exactly. because the West has now said, okay, coal is back. Okay, for the foreseeable future, coal is back. So all of it should actually cause the world peace movement to come up and demand of uh, the West, demand of Russia, demand of Ukraine, return to the peace process inst uh -huh. instead of this competitive uh, information war and the military war on the ground, right. instead of supplying more and more arms to uh, the Ukrainian government, which may or may not be in a position to even use most of it, but it gives them a feeling that they have, the West has its back. So given this, I would have thought even during Korean War, there were interventions made by others to bring peace. Uh, Nehru and India was a key element in that. But at the moment, everybody seems to be saying, well, you know, we'll look after our interests. As Nirmala Sitaraman's famous words, I'll look after my country's interest. But our country's interest, the global interest, is also peace. Absolutely. And that seems to be con completely missing in the international scenario today. We're all trying to negotiate with our self-interest between the players. So we don't have that kind of international opinion. Please come to the table, resolve the issues. Yes, I think uh, Russia has a point that there were, there were attacks on Russian identity, language uh, in, in, in Donbass region. That is something which needs to be put on the ground. Minsk Accords had given regional autonomy to Russian speakers in that, in that part, of the, uh, part of Ukraine. So these are real issues. They should not be uh, wished away. At the same time, if Ukraine government wants to uh, have Nazis, then what does Russia do? That's a question that we need to address, right. but at the same time, do we need a war for it? Does the West need to back the Nazi forces in Ukraine? They'll get a blowback tomorrow. Exactly. It's not that the Nazi uh, sympathizers are not there in Western Europe as well. So these, all of these are already there. So I think this needs much more far-seeing diplomacy. And at the moment, we are leaving it to Zelensky and a uh, few people to set the terms of the peace, and which is certainly not in the interest, larger interest of the people. Right. So unfortunately, the United States, which has become treaty incapable, also seems to be peace incapable, but it is war capable. Right. And I think that's a threat we face. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prabir. Will the chances for peace improve in the coming days? What will happen in the military situation? We'll be tracking all this in future episodes of Mapping Fault Lines. Until then, keep watching News Click.